Welcome to the Emergency Medicine Cases Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anton Hellman, bringing you Canada's brightest minds in emergency medicine, live from the Emergency Medicine Update Conference in Toronto. On this special episode, Beyond ACLS, taking cardiac arrest care to the next level, we have POCUS guru, master educator, assistant professor at the University of Toronto, the calmest, nicest guy you'll ever meet, the one and only Dr. Jordan Schenken. And today, we're gonna show you how we can do better than standard ACLS. Yeah, you see, ACLS was originally designed to give us a common language and help us avoid paralysis in a crisis situation. Yeah, I mean, it's a sensible goal, but on the other hand, with each year that passes, it seems like ACLS has become more and more simplified and that appeals to sort of a broader scope of rescuers, those that rarely run a code, but cardiac arrest physiology really ain't that simple. You know, managing these patients requires a little bit more finesse. Exactly, those of us who work in an emergency department and manage codes on a regular basis should really be expected to have a more sophisticated approach, don't you think? Absolutely. So to help you up your cardiac arrest care game, we're gonna present a case that shows these three events the ACLS way, and then a more finessed way. We're gonna talk about VF that just won't convert after a few shocks. We're gonna assess for return of spontaneous circulation by doing a pulse check. And then we're gonna talk about the arrested pulseless electrical activity patient. All right, so here's the case. A 50 year old woman is out for a run and collapses to the ground. Bystander CPR is performed. EMS arrives and finds her in course VF. She's defibrillated twice and given an amp of epi but remains in VF. She's transported to your ED. On arrival, she's still in VF after having three doses of epinephrine and one dose of amiodarone. All right, so let's see how VF has managed the ACLS way, and in particular, look for pauses in chest compressions during this video. Okay, 30 seconds until two minutes are up. All right, let's hold compressions and check around. Monitor shows defib. Okay, let's prepare to defib. Charge to 200. Charge, I'm clear, you're clear, everybody's clear. Shock delivered. And we can resume CPR. How long since our last epi? Uh, we've given three doses. Last one was three minutes ago. Okay, let's give another one milligram of epi IV. One milligram of epi in. How long since your last epi Um, Five minutes. Let's give another 150 milligrams of amio IV. Uh, 150 amio given. All right. So, Jordan, what strategies can we use for these patients in shock refractory VF that's beyond ACLS? So, Anton, there's, there's four strategies to consider. Uh, we want to eliminate the perishock pause. We want to shock with two defibrillators instead of one. We want to hold the epinephrine. And then, finally, we want to think about giving the fast-acting beta blocker, Esmolol. All right, Esmolol. So, let's start with minimizing the perishock pause. So why is it important to minimize the sherry po sh shock pause in the first place? So it's all about one critical factor, and that's your coronary perfusion pressure. If you can't get the patient's CPP above 15 millimeters of mercury, your patient is simply not going to achieve ROSC. And when there's a pause in CPR, as you can see on this, on this figure, there's a dramatic drop off in your CPP. And the longer that pause, the longer it takes to get the CPP back up. Yeah, that red part there is, is bad. So how do we minimize that, that dive you see in the red there? So there's a few simple strategies that we can use to minimizing the perishock pause. Many of the newer monitors actually have a look-through ability, so you can actually un uh, analyze the underlying rhythm while you're performing your chest compressions. And this can give you an idea that the rhythm might have changed even before you do your next rhythm check. Yeah, and there's, there's a few things that I always do. First, I have the compressor count down before they're about to pause. I make sure that the defibrillator is charged before uh, there's going to be a pause in chest compressions, and then the compressor just comes up literally for one second, shock, back down on the chest. Um, and sometimes the nurses don't love it so much, but I always use a metronome 
set at 110 beats per minute, which has been proven to, to maximize that chance of getting your coronary perfusion pressure up there. So Anton, that's how we minimize the perishock pause, but what about double defibrillation? Uh, can you tell us how applying two sets of defibr defibrillation pads and shocking with twice the energy actually works? Right, so if standard defib isn't working, consider double defib, because 80% of patients who are resistant to one shock will actually convert with two shocks. So the idea is that you really need to depolarize 90% of the myocardium for this to work. So adding that second set of pads changes the vectors such that you're much more likely to, to achieve that 90% threshold. And there's actually a few small studies uh, that show, that are really promising in showing return of spontaneous circulation with double defib. So we've covered the perishock pause and double defibrillation. Next up is talking about scaling back our epinephrine. In VF storm, there's a huge catecholamine sur surge, right? Right, so, I mean, I never really understood why you're adding this catecholamine fuel, like epinephrine, to this catecholamine firestorm that's, that is refractory VF. In fact, you wanna do exactly the opposite. You know, you wanna block that catecholamine surge so that the VF breaks. And that's why scaling back on the epi at this point really makes sense. And besides, most VF is caused by MI, right? So when you're giving epinephrine, you're just squeezing down on those coronary arteries more, and you're just call it causing more ischemia, which is not a good idea. So if epinephrine isn't the answer, then there, what other options do we have to kind of block that catecholamine surge? Uh, well, there's good old lidocaine, which is worth a try if amiodarone hasn't worked. Uh, what else is there? So there's esmolol, right? Yeah. Um, and so this fast-acting beta blocker actually increases the fibrillation threshold, and damaged myocardial cells are more sensitive to sympathetic tone, which esmolol blocks. Okay, so that's how it works, but the big question is, does it work? Well, this is absolutely the mind-blowing part, Anton. Um, there's pretty much no medication in cardiac arrest, including epinephrine, that's ever been shown to improve survival to hospital discharge, and that's until esmolol came along. Not only does esmolol double the rate of return of spontaneous circulation from about one-third of patients to two-thirds of patients, but it actually increases survival to hospital discharge with good neurologic function from about 11% up to 50%. That being said, the studies are small. We need mm -hmm. larger studies to confirm these findings, but so far the evidence actually looks pretty promising. So at this point then, you've given amio, maybe lidocaine, you've tried double defib, you've loaded your patient with esmolol, what's next? So let's watch this video to see how we can optimize our refractory VF management using those four strategies we just covered. 30 seconds until two minutes are up. Okay, Sue, let's hold compression, Craig, let's check a rhythm. Monitor shows VFib. Okay, Sue, let's, when you continue to see while we're charging, and Craig, charging compared to VFib. Okay, charging, I'm gonna shock with a three second countdown, okay, Sue? Three, two, one, clear, shock delivered, continue CPR. Craig, how long since our last epi? Uh, we've given three doses, the last one was three minutes ago. Okay, we've given this patient three doses of epi already with no improvement, so we're in shock refractory VF. Let's start uh, as well at 500 mics per kilogram and set up a second set of pads for dual sequential deceleration. Okay. Okay, Esmolol 35 milligrams is in and infusion started. Okay, I'm going to set up the pads for the double defibrillation. So I'm just going to sneak this one under here. Pads are set up. 30 Charging seconds until, monitors. 30 seconds until two minutes are up. Okay. Both defibrillators are charged. I'm gonna shock again with a three second countdown, Sue. Three, two, one, clear. Shocks delivered, continue CPR. All right, so let's review then the key elements of shock re uh, refractory V-fib. Number one. Minimizing the peri-shock pause by pre-charging the defibrillator, counting down, and coming up from the chest just for one second. Number two. Place a second set of pads on your patient and double down on your energy. 
Number three. No more epinephrine because the catecholamine surge that's already happening, you don't want to happen anymore. Number four. And consider an esmol loading dose and an infusion because it's the only drug that may improve survival to hospital discharge. All right. Okay, now we're all ready for the next part. So let's get back to the case. The patient's now in an organized rhythm on the monitor, and it's time for a pulse check. So let's see how pulse check checks are done ACLS style. Okay, two minutes are up. Okay, let's hold compressions and check, check a rhythm. We have a rhythm. Uh, can I get someone to please check a pulse? Not sure if I feel one. Yeah, I feel one. I feel one. Nope, I don't feel one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel one. Yeah, I think there's a strong result. I'm not sure. I, I can't wait. really feel much here. So wait, just, well, I, just I to clarify, do we feel a pulse? No. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let, let's talk about pulse checks for a second. So first, a reminder that we only need to do pulse checks if you see an organized rhythm on the monitor. And secondly, probably more importantly, we know that pulse checks are extremely unreliable as we've just seen in this video. Your patient could have a systolic blood pressure of 60 or even higher with no detectable pulse. Yeah, absolutely. So Jordan, how can we improve the pulse check? So I'd suggest using point of care ultrasound or POCUS to really? see. Really? <laughs> Shocking, I know. Shocker. Uh, yeah, just check to see if the heart is beating vigorously or not. If you have a vigorously beating heart, then chest compressions are unlikely to be beneficial, and there's very likely to be a pulse that you just can't feel. And if you can't get a good look at the heart, you can actually put the probe on the carotid and look for a carotid pulse. All right, and if, if, you, can't get an R, if you can get an RT in there really early, then art line can be really helpful. Even if you can't get an art line in, though, uh, like Ruben was saying this morning, just having a SAT probe, if you see a really good waveform, you know that there's good organ perfusion happening. Uh, but Jordan, let's get back to the case. Uh, let's get back to the POCUS and uh, see how you can actually use POCUS on the, the heart and on the carotid to help you out here. So most of us are pretty familiar with looking at the heart with POCUS. And if you see a heart that looks like this in a pulseless patient, the patient's likely perfusing. And CPR is probably unnecessary. Giving megadoses of epinephrine is probably harmful. All right, makes sense. So what you're doing there, you're, you're adjusting the epi based on like a two second look at the heart. Exactly. Okay. And in contrast to the clip we just watched with the vigorously beating heart, if you see a heart that looks like this, that's barely moving or not moving at all, it's time to immediately get back on the chest and resume your compressions. All right, so what about looking at the carotid for, for a pulse, Jordan? So in this clip, you can see pulsations in the carotid, which basically means the patient has a pulse. And it's a lot easier to see a pulse than to feel a pulse. And if you're not sure what you're seeing, you can always put your color on like that, and you can actually see flow within the carotid artery pretty easily. And in contrast, here's another patient in cardiac arrest, and we put the probe on the neck, and even with minimal probe pressure, we can see the carotid completely collapses. This patient has no perfusion. You know right away you need to get back and resume your chest compressions. Okay, so now that we have a good idea of how we can use POCUS, an art line or an O2SAT probe to determine if the patient has a pulse or not, uh, let's see how it's actually done. Two minutes are up. Okay, let's see, let's hold compressions and check a rhythm. We have an organized rhythm. Okay, Craig, can you check for cardiac activity? No significant cardiac activity on ultrasound. Okay, see, so let's resume CPR. Okay, so let's get back to the case. So the patient seems to have no pulse on POCUS and has a poorly beating heart. And so the resuscitation continues with high quality CPR. After two more minutes, there's another rhythm check and now we see a narrow complex rhythm on the monitor. So we're dealing with pulseless electrical activity. All right, so here's the ACLS approach where no pulse is palpated, uh, so more epinephrine's given, chest compressions are restarted, and the discussion of the H's and T's of PEA arrest ensues. Okay, so let's hold compressions. Okay, we have a rhythm. Okay, do we have a pulse? No pulse. Okay, so resume CPR. So now we have a patient in PEA. So let's leave another milligram of FEIV, okay. and let's go through our H's and T's to make sure we've fixed any reversible causes. So hypoxia. Five uh, or six, and six in yeah, kids, right? Because thrombosis come pulmonary. Right. Uh, and the other T, the tenduri, tenduri is one of the T's for sure. Tenduri, half.
acidosis. Yeah. Acidosis with an H. It was, that's what it was. That's acid reflux. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's thrombosis no. cardiac. No, that's not right. Uh, All right, so we can, we can definitely do better than that with the help of uh, a simple approach to PEA that actually Amal presented here, uh, I think, a couple years ago uh, at this conference. Yeah, so, and I'm pretty sure tenduri is not one of the T's, but I'll yeah. have to check on that. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so in addition to the simple approach to diagnosing uh, the underlying cause of PEA using your QRS width and POCUS, we should again thinking of, be thinking about adjusting our epinephrine dose based on what we see on our cardiac ultrasound. So you mean looking at how vigorous the heart is beating on POCUS and then adjusting your epi according to that? Exactly. I like to think of it as pseudo-PEA. So if you see a narrow complex and a vigorously beating heart, this is very different than a patient with true PEA who has no effective contractility. And in fact, we know that in over 50% of patients with PEA, they actually have organized cardiac activity. And if you give a full milligram of epinephrine to those patients, uh, it might actually cause harm to them. So instead, if the heart is beating well on ultrasound and there's no palpable pulse, I would actually lower the dose and use a push dose epinephrine of 10 to 20 micrograms and then start an epi infusion. The way you get, you get into this PEA algorithm then, the simple approach is first you decide, the first branch is to decide whether it's a narrow or wide complex. So if it's a narrow complex, the next thing you do is pull out your ultrasound and you can get your differential from that. Exactly. So just sticking the ultrasound probe in the epigastrium, even during CPR, you're going to be able to see if there's a massive pericardial effusion suggesting uh, cardiac tamponade, and then you can go and perform an ultrasound-guided pericardiosynthesis. Yeah, and then if you see a pneumothorax on ultrasound, you can immediately decompress it. Exactly. And you can look at the IBC, and, and if the IBC is really flat, it indicates the preload's low, and you should probably be giving your patient a fluid challenge. And in contrast, if the IBC is really massively distended, you should be thinking about obstructive causes of shock, like a tension pneumothorax or even a massive PE. Yeah, and talking about PE, you know, if you see the RV looking way bigger than the LV in cardiac arrest, or even if they're in profound shock, you need to consider the possibility of a massive PE and consider lysing that patient. And if you're really good, you'll actually see a wall motion abnormality, and that would indicate an MI, you're going to call your cath lab. All right, so that was narrow complex, PEA. Uh, then on the other side of it, there's the wide complex. Um, and that's actually much simpler because there's really only three things you need to know about. One is uh, if this could be hyper-K, like you've got a, a, a dialysis patient, um, then you go ahead and give calcium. Exactly, or a sodium channel blocker overdose, um, which like TCAs or cocaine, uh, in which case you're going to give bicarb. Yep. And we all know that MIs can cause a narrow, wide, narrow or a wide complex, like a left bundle branch block, for example, will look wide. Um, and so that's the other thing you need to think about in both narrow and, and wide complex. And usually from the story, it's pretty easy to sort out which of those three things it is. Yeah. All right. So now that you've got an idea of how to integrate the PEA algorithm, let's, let's see it in action. Okay, hey, see, let's hold compressions. Okay, we have an organized rhythm. Okay, Craig, do we have any cardiac activity? We do have some cardiac activity. Okay, so let's hold off on CPR right now, push 10 mics of EPIV, and then start a 10 mic per minute infusion. Craig, could you do a full rush protocol for me? Okay, so the heart looks like poor LV function, Ten no mics. signs of right heart strain, and no pericardial effusion. Great, thanks, Hugh. Okay, good lung sliding bilaterally, sure. no pneumothorax. Can you check the IVC for me? Yep. Happy infusion's running. Thank okay, you. the IVC looks flat. So you, can we get a 500cc bolus in this patient right now? Okay, no free fluid in the abdomen and the aorta looks fine. All right. Oh, and I feel a carotid pulse. Okay. So it looks like we had a patient in cardiogenic shock. After we get an ECG, can we notify the cath lab and let them know we have a post-rest patient coming up with an ETA of about five minutes? Okay, we will do. All right, so let's bring it home with the key take-home points. So first, for shock ref refractory V-fib, eliminate that cherry pock pause either by using look-through monitors or else you count down before you, you stop compressions, you pre-charge the defibrillator before you stop compressions, and Bring, that, bring those hands up only for one second and go directly back onto the chest. Next, slap a second set of pads on the patient and shock with double the joules. 
And don't forget, if your patient's in VF storm, the catecholamines are raging, you should consider stopping the epinephrine or at least lowering the dose, especially if you think the cause is an MI. And then lastly, for shock refractory VF, if amio and lido didn't work, you can give a bolus of esmolol followed by an infusion. Remember, that's the only drug that's been showed to uh, improve survival to hospital discharge after cardiac arrest. Remember, the reliability of the manual pulse checks is really like flipping a coin. So instead, use focus on the heart or the carotid, use your O2 SAT probe, or even better, an art line if you can get one. And for PEA, forget about the H's and T's approach. Instead, you should be thinking narrow or wide and use your focus. Yeah, and so key and easy to do, pseudo-PEA. If you see a heart that's beating vigorously, even if there's no pulse, use a lower dose of epinephrine. Well. That about wraps it up for this month's EM Cases episode. Until next time, take it easy.